Welcome everyone. Good, uh, good morning, afternoon, evening and night, depending on where you are in the world. Welcome to this uh, second of three webinars in our methane webinar series uh, by the Climate and Clean Air Coalition on government action to reduce methane from the livestock sector. My name is Nathan Borkberg Parnell. I am the science affairs coordinator for the Climate and Clean Air Coalition and have the great honor of moderating this session today. We have a, an excellent slate of uh, presentations and, and a panel discussion, um, and then it will be, be followed by uh, a Q&A session um, in which you will be asked to engage with us. So uh, before uh, we launch in, I wanna cover um, the rules for this webinar. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, please, you can ask questions in uh, the chat uh, by using the Q&A function. Uh, it's an integrated function within, within WebEx. Uh, we are moderating that chat and, and can feed those questions to the panelists during the Q&A session. Alternatively, uh, next slide, you can ask questions directly by using the raise hand function. Uh, the instructions here are on the screen in the slide, and uh, we will uh, we will call on you and uh, allow you to uh, to speak uh, to the panelists. Thank you. Next, so uh, our opening remarks today uh, will be provided by Dr. Alice Alpert, uh, Foreign Affairs Officer for the U.S. Department of State, and she served as the U.S. CCAC focal point since. 2018. It is my great pleasure to hand over to you now, uh, Alice. Take it away. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today and for CCAC's leadership in reducing short lived climate pollutants. Um, so, I currently work for the US Department of State um, and I support senior director and White House liaison Rick Duke in his role as CCAC co chair on behalf of the US government. Um, and as you know, the special presidential envoy for climate, John Kerry, is relentlessly focused on keeping a safer 1.5 degree future within reach for all of us. And according to the latest report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, methane accounts for about half of the 1 degree Celsius net rise in uh, global average temperature that we're facing right now. And on the other side, the CCAC's global climate, or sorry, global methane assessment shows that rapid global methane reductions could avoid more than 0.2 degrees C of warming by 2050. And the world is now recognizing that methane is by far the top priority short lived climate pollutant that we do need to tackle. Um, and I would say notice, noting that uh, N2O in the livestock sector is also a very important pollutant. Um, so in the near term to keep 1.5 degrees within reach and prevent this dangerous warming, deep methane reductions are as important as carbon dioxide reductions. And to that end, um, President Biden and European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen um, and several emerging economies announced their public support for the global methane pledge at the major economies forum last month. And the pledge aims to eliminate that over uh, 0.2 degrees C of warming by 2050 um, by reducing global methane emissions at least 30% from 2020 levels by 2030. And countries representing 20% of total global em methane emissions and nearly half of the global economy have already signed on to the pledge at the MEF meeting, at the um, major economies forum. But, but the US and the EU, um, we wish to secure many more governments um, commitment by the time of COP26 in November, which is in just less than a month. So to that end, um, Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, John Kerry, and European Commission Executive Vice President Franz Timmermans will host a virtual ministerial on um, October 11th, which is next Monday, um, in order to increase endorsements and answer any questions about the pledge. So all countries are invited to join the ministerial. Um, and please contact me. I'll put my uh, email in the chat if you have any questions. 
So turning on to agriculture in the livestock sector, it presents unique challenges, as we all know, due to dispersed practices and the scale of operations. Um, so in the US, in partnership with US farmers and ranchers, the US Department of Agriculture is working to significantly expand the voluntary adoption of climate smart agriculture practices that will reduce emissions from key agriculture sources um, by incentivizing the deployment of improved man manure management systems, anaerobic digesters, new livestock feeds, composting, and other practices. And the US Department of Agriculture supports reduction um, of, of emissions through a wide range of programs, including research to advance the science and understanding of agricultural uh, sources and mitigation. Um, on the international side, um, avoiding these emissions doesn't have to come at the cost of livelihoods. In fact, it can go hand in hand with improvements in cost effectiveness, nutrition, and animal health. Um, so improved manure storage and management, including biogas production, can be implemented even at negative cost when accounting for savings for the cost of uh, liquid propane gas. That is avoided. <clears throat> and the US has a range of programs that we can help to um, evaluate incentives and pro policies for um, agriculture mitigation, agricultural emissions mitigation. <laughs> Um, and so there are substantial co-benefits here, both economic and nutritional, as well as environmental. Um, so the U.S. looks forward to continuing to engage in the CCNC's agriculture initiative um, and to facilitate specific approaches to address these emissions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alice. The, the news about the global methane pledge is, is truly exciting and transformative. Uh, and I, 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 can, I know I speak on behalf of everyone in the CCAC Secretariat and hopefully all of our partnership in uh, welcoming the pledge. And uh, we look forward to supporting uh, not only expanding the signatory countries, but you know, uh, helping support implementation uh, over this next decade. Um, so, the before we move to the the presentations uh, from our panelists in the panelist discussion, I'm going to give you a quick introduction and overview of the global methane assessment, some of the science, particularly around the livestock sector. For those of you who know me, you know uh, that uh, climate and clean air and methane are some of my favorite topics. And uh, if you give me free reign, I will uh, I can talk for days about them. So I only have five minutes to do this. I'm going to try to rein myself in. But I, as a little bit of context, uh, I was a coordinator of this assessment, one of the co-authors. And I think it'd be useful to explain quickly sort of the genesis of why uh, why we decided as a coalition that we wanted to conduct this assessment uh, and the intention in, in, in its development. We originally, uh, when we originally conceived this assessment, um, we recognized as a coalition broadly, right, and, and as a scientific community that, that methane contributes to the formation of tropospheric ozone and tropospheric ozone being a greenhouse gas and a substantial uh, air pollutant that impacts uh, ecosystem health and, and public health in, in, in truly profound and, uh, and permanent ways. However, uh, prior to conducting this assessment, if you wanted to take a methane mitigation strategy or policy and analyze its potential impact on public health through the nexus of tropospheric ozone and, and, uh, and air pollution, you would need to run a, a climate model. Uh, which you know many countries have access to, not all of them certainly, and 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 it certainly took quite a bit of time to conduct that. Which means that there was always a disconnect between the creation and the genesis of a methane policy or strategy or technology that you wanted to implement, and the uh, assessment of of its potential impacts. And what we wanted to do was we wanted to see if we could make that link a little more, a, a little faster. Uh, a little easier, a little more explicit. So we conducted a multi-model exercise with five different international modeling teams who were involved in IPC assessments and various air quality modeling around the world. And what we were able to develop through this process were coefficients, essentially uh, multiplication factors that would allow you to assess what one, one ton of methane changed 
either emitted or, or prevented from being emitted in the atmosphere, what it would do in terms of ozone formation anywhere else on Earth, and then translate that into various benefits uh, for public health, for ecosystem health, uh, in real terms for human beings and avoiding uh, emergency room visits and uh, avoiding um, loss of uh, agricultural production because ozone harms, harms plants and, and a whole raft of other benefits. Um, so our intention with this report is to make that link truly explicit and as 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 is immediate as possible to uh, to really uh, empower policymakers and and the broader policy and technical communities um, to start really using the multiple benefits of methane mitigation uh, more effectively to to catalyze additional action and mobilize resources. Uh, you know, we're not we we we're not communicating anything truly transformative in terms of uh, additional new knowledge about the fact that ozone um, you know kills people, causes asthma and other respiratory diseases. Uh, but we are making the link um, immediate, and and hopefully that will allow for it, it will it has allowed for quite a transformation in terms of the uh, the the visibility of the importance of methane mitigation. Globally and and uh, increased uh, and will increase the action going forward. So in the agricultural sector, what we found globally uh, through this assessment is that uh, uh, technical measures, if applied in all three main anthropogenic sectors for methane, it's oil, gas, and coal, waste, and agriculture, uh, could reduce methane emissions by 30 percent by 2030. And if we add in additional measures like switching away from fossil fuels to renewable energy and other behavioral shifts and production shifts, we can get to a 45 percent reduction in in total methane by 2030. That would translate into a third of a degree avoided warming uh, within the 2040 to 2050 range and also translate into truly concrete and transformative benefits for public health. Uh, agricultural production, avoided lost work hours because we're avoiding um, heat impacts of, of the additional heat caused by ozone and methane, and, and many more. Many of these have direct economic impacts that can also be quantified. For the agricultural sector, uh, there is a substantial opportunity, as the dark blue bar up above, there's a substantial opportunity to mitigate methane from the agricultural sector within this next decade but uh but within the agricultural within the three sectors the, we have the most uncertainty about the total potential for mitigation um uh, going forward uh there's a there's a very clear understanding of of the potentials in the fossil fuel sector or at least more clear waste similarly much more clear but there's a there's an enormous diversity in terms of the models uh, and what they assume we can do in terms of capturing real methane mitigation in the agricultural sector. And it's an area that we're going to have to put a lot of effort into to shore up and really catalyze action uh, in this decade, not only to achieve real mitigation, but to uh, you know, expand our knowledge of, of the opportunities and the technologies uh, that, can, that are going to be deployable, hopefully, in this decade and beyond to achieve even more mitigation going forward. So um, we assume in the models that the agricultural sector, we can get between five and 42 megatons a year mitigated in terms of total methane. It's a very large range, five to 42 by 2030. Uh, the average cost is between 300 and $900 per ton of, of methane, uh, which is actually quite cheap if you convert it to carbon dioxide equivalents. But if you offset that by the actual benefit provided in terms of public health and agricultural production, uh, most of these uh, these activities and interventions actually pay for themselves uh, or, or are totally cost negative. Uh, I know I've gone over my five minutes. I said I was going to do it and I, I, and, uh, I, I couldn't stop myself. I apologize. So I'm going to uh, we've developed a methane tool uh, from the uh, from the conclusions of the global methane assessment modeling uh, exercise. Uh, there's a link here on this on this uh, slide. Uh, this tool is really, uh, really quite exciting and engaging. Hopefully, and you can actually look at the uh, the mitigation potential that exists uh, from the different modeling groups. What they assume is possible in terms of mitigation potential, not just in the livestock sector, but for all major sectors. And uh, based upon that assessed mitigation potential, you can actually map out a, a whole raft of different benefits um, achievable from that mitigation, uh, and uh, many of them that I've that I've talked about, and many more. Um, I'm going to stop there. Uh, 
uh, as I said, this is a really exciting sector, and it's an area where we need to we need to be putting a lot of effort, particularly the livestock sector. Um, uh, it's it's one of the largest sectors of emissions, and it's an area that we need to be uh, focusing on uh, going forward. So, uh, without further ado, I want to move forward with the country presentations. The first um, from Dr. Agus Susanto, who is the director of the Indonesian Center for Animal Research and Development. Previously, he was the director of the Indonesian Center for Feed Quality Testing and Certification under the Ministry of Agriculture. He holds a master's and a PhD degree in the field of nutrition science and field feed technology. Uh, uh, Dr. Susanto, uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to have you with us today, um, and I look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Lais. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Please be upon us, Your Excellency Director of Climate and Clean Air Coalition, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Uh, it is indeed a great pleasure and honor for me to be here today at this webinar. Let me express my most Sincere thanks to our college from CCAC for organizing this event. I am Agus Santo, Director of Indonesian Center for Animal Research and Development, Indonesian Agency for Agriculture Research and Development, Indonesia Ministry of Agriculture. I will present the topic on Indonesian's action to mitigate methane emission from the livestock sector. Indonesia. Indonesia has tier two calculation uh, before. Sorry, Indonesia has tier two calculation for livestock methane emission since 200 of 2014. We use livestock population feed intake, gross energy intake, methane conversion ratio to generate local emission factor. Currently, Indonesia is developing tier two refinement. Next. In the initial, in the initial tier two calculation, the largest methane emission come from beef cattle. Second largest was buffalo, followed by sheep, goat, dairy cattle, and horse. Beef cattle is the primary methane emitter due to high population number and the use of low quality feed. This to is case, ladies and gentlemen. Next slide. There are several strategies to mitigate methane emission, such as using several types of feed ingredient, feed supplement, and fit additive, as you can see on the table. From left to right, uh, the strategy uh, our country. Next, smallholder farmer have mitigated enteric fermentation. Mitigating practice in smallholder farmer have done a lot, even though they didn't realize. Utilization of legume such as Caliandra calotirsus, Lyricidia sepium, Leucina leposepala, Indugovera, as a source of protein in the resin, and a source of feed additive rich in tannin, saponin, or other chemical compound that play important role in reducing methane emissions. Similarly, the activity of supplementation of grass and other forage fields feed such as agriculture by product as a source of carbohydrate, the material commonly used in plain kernel meal, copra meal, rice bran, cassava leaves, and others, these ingredients are easy to find in Indonesia. Component of dead feed, a special type of carbohydrate, are important for methane production. 
they are able to influence the ruminal pH and alter the microbia. Next slide. In summary, activity of methane mitigation in Indonesia can be carried out by increasing feed efficiency through the use of local high nutrient feed ingredient or directly through rumen manipulation using bioactive component contained in forage legume. legume. Next. In, sorry, next. Yeah. So Indonesia has several local cattle breeds such as Bali, Bali, Bali cattle, Hongol crossbreed, Aceh, Aceh cattle, Madura cattle, and Sumba Hongol cattle. You can see the digestibility and rumen microbe from several breeds of local cattle on the slide. On all crossbreed, gas 230 billion colony forming unit per gram of rumen, of rumen bacterial. Composition and micro population in the rumen influence methane emission due to feed digestibility. Based on the feed digestibility and rumen microbe, on all crossbreed cross have the potential to be developed as low emission cattle. Next, next. There are for future program and why forward our country. First, replicate the national program of improve pasture introduce legume varieties adapted to different micro climates for example saline land dry land seed land second utilization of agriculture by products rich in protein content to reduce the methane emission third boosting extension and educate farmer how to utilize agriculture by product. Last one, support research to explore other local ingredients rich in protein and other secondary compound. Next, from our experiences, Indonesia welcomes border collaboration related to mitigate methane emission from the livestock sector. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Susanto. That was a very impressive presentation. I look forward to the next steps and hopefully we can support you um, in, in greater implementation and collaboration. Um, we will turn now to the to the next presentation from uh, Felipe Garcia from Uruguay. He's a biologist with a master's in ecology with more than 10 years of experience working on the link between agricultural production and the environment. He works uh, in the coordination of livestock and climate project in Uruguay, which seeks to strengthen a climate smart livestock strategy in Uruguay and promote practices among producers for sustainable livestock production with reduced emissions. Thank you very much. Felipe, please take it away. Thank you, Nathan. Good morning to all. Well, I, I will present uh, some of the Uruguay approach to reduce methane emissions. Next, please. Okay, due to the dimensions of agricultural production in Uruguay and the relative low industrial and transport development in the country, um, also the renewal um, energy matrix in the country that is already put in place, 
we have a, a unique profile in emissions in, in our country that where AFOLU sector is around 75% of the emissions uh, of the total national emissions. And so the, the profile is starred by this, uh, this sector. Our country first NDC was developed around integral measures goals that combine mitigation actions and also uh, co-benefits in these actions uh, associated with adaptation, nature conservation, restoration, productivity improvements, and social and economic development that we believe that must go together. Next, please. Here you can see some of the goals that the country defined in, in our first NDC. In the left, you can see um, goals against gross national product. You see methane intensity with gross national product, the first in the left. And these goals are ambitious and are uh, in a good advance to being uh, uh, accomplished in 2025. The, the, the approach of the country is to decar decarbonize the economy, but also, you can say, demethanize the economy and denitrificate the economy or something like that. <laughs> Uh, on the on the right, you can see some specific livestock uh, goals that are in our NDC. The first one in the up 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 and and, and right is methane against meat production, beef production, and as you can see, we have a good advance here against the. 1990 uh, baseline, but we have also a little way to go still. The, 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 the next one is nitrous oxide, and this the next one is um, good practices to avoid uh, soil carbon emission in grasslands. So we are, we are also um, combining these intensity goals with some good practices goals in the NDC to um, to manage to prove good practices in, in grasslands, in, in livestock production. Next one, please. Um, sorry. So, so our NDC has a special focus on ambitions in a follow measures and goals. They should good. They show good advance, but we want it, and the country is uh, uh, wanting to to deepen these these measures and to to go faster in these uh, results. So, in in 2019, we designed a project that is called uh, Lifetime and Climate. is uh, implemented by FAO, JF, Climate and Clean Air Coalition, and the Ministry of Agriculture and Environment of Uruguay. Next, please. The objective of this project is to mitigate climate change and restore degraded lands to the promotion of climate smart practices in the livestock sector. And it works on a on a win-win opportunity that exists in the Uruguay livestock production. Uruguay doesn't have uh, forests as, nat as natural ecosystems, but it has grasslands. So um, there's, there's some research that it has showed that we can um, Accomplish diverse goals or multiple benefits in 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 promoting good practices in the uh, livestock farms. 
this this win win opportunity has the the opportunity to improve productivity, net income for the farmers, climate resilience for the farms, work time and management capacity in farmers, also grass growth, natural grasslands uh, restoration or or conservation, and it it could uh, improve emissions intensity per unit of product in a business as usual scenario that Uruguay is increasing production for the last 20 years now. And also it's in, in a, uh, several models that we have run, these practices uh, have the potential to sequestrate soil carbon in grassland soils. So this opportunity was the, 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 the main focus of this project. Next one, please. The, the project has three components. I will mention two. The, the component two is the uh, one in the field where we are working with uh, 60 farms, 60, yes, 60 farms, commercial farms, where we are uh, giving technical assistance to them to develop and redesign their, their, their practices. And then we are monitoring very hard all the variables from productive, economic, environmental variables, focusing on emissions and soil carbon content, and also some social indicators. Uh, the component two, sorry, the component one will be will be escalating from from these results in the field to develop a national strategy. And well, the project has some targets in the in the area that it will be uh, working with both directly and indir indirectly with, with uh, um, some diffusion and, and uh, extension uh, programs and also some targets on on emissions reductions in the the direct area and in the indirect area next one please the work on the on field is uh, based on a co-innovation approach that is a, a way of working with the farmers in a very horizontal way with a systemic approach on the farms and also uh, with the community the local community to be able to learn about uh, the, the all the process and not only giving technical assistance that is dependent on the on the project. Uh, at the same time, piloting, monitoring, and and being able to have scientific researchers uh, taking all the information about this process is is also important. Well, the climate smart practices and, and performance goal that the project is uh, promoting in these farms is mainly very, very briefly manage and improve grass growth and supply to the, to the animals, synchronize annual grass growth peaks with animal feeding requirements, manage body fat reserves and improve body condition, weaning, growth speed, reproduction, fattening rates, and slaughter age in the in the, the in the animals the production systemic and, and strategic planning and management for the farms then we are monitoring and recording uh, a lot of variables but i will concentrate on the emissions and and soil carbon variables here the grass height growth of grass growth grass grass quality, diet quality through manure, diet methane potential. Also, we are monitoring GHG emissions, both with the IPCC guidelines and with the newly calibrated factors that we are uh, getting from the field. Soil, soil carbon content in various pools and also another environmental productive and economic social variables. Next one, please. So, to to show you some uh, preliminary results from the first year of the field, 
I have to say that we had a severe, very severe drought in the spring and last spring and last summer. You can see our map in red there is watering the soil from less, last spring and summer. This is not to say that the results, not to have an excuse for the results, but to say that the results are more impressive, more impressive even with this scenario, climate scenario in, in the last uh, spring. The average stocking rate was reduced in, the, in, in all farms in an average of 18%. This was not a goal. This was not a priori a goal for the for the farms. So it is a result of uh, looking for the best stocking rates in the farms to promote production, but mainly grass growth. Uh, the beef production increase, increased in average of 6% and the sheep production 15%. 60% of the farms, of the 60 farms, increases at least 50% of the net income against the baseline of the previous year, previous years. And in a preliminary subset of, of farms that we have all, already have that uh, on emissions, the emissions intensity per unit of product was reduced 27% in the first year of work of the project. And this was not expected, but we also found gross emission reduced by 17%. Uh, and we are projecting with some uh, production uh, projections that we can get to 10% uh, gross emission reduced at the end of the transitions in the farms. This is because farms will uh, lower the stocking rate a little bit more on the first years to promote grass growth, and then maybe they will increase some the stocking rate a little bit for the for the last years to the stabilized uh, system. This is only detecting uh, the stocking the stock changes. We are not uh, yet detecting the diet effects that we will be able to detect at the end of the project, the digestibility of the natural grassland, what is the digestibility of species mixes, the selection of the animals uh, on the different grasses. And we have not yet get some results on solid carbon sequestration. So this 10% uh, that we are projecting could be even more uh, more in the in the future with when we have more data from the project so we are excited with these results thank you very much thank you felipe the impressive results even even given you know the challenges with the drought i i have to say um i'm very i was very interested to see achieved 80, 88% of uh, the NDC objective in terms of reducing emissions per kilogram in, in beef cattle. Um, I, I guess I have one question or statement. Um, I wonder, are you able to differentiate, particularly with the projects um, that, that deal with, with soil enhancement, grasslands management, you're, you're addressing both CO2 and methane, you know, other pollutants, are you able to differentiate uh, between those pollutants or are you only uh, uh, looking at CO2E? If you're able to split out the specific methane component of that, then you know, that can be plugged into the methane tool and, you know, and project all of the various benefits, um, not only for these projects, yes. but, but in terms of your, your commitments to the NDCs. Yes, we in the project we can differentiate the, the the different gases and in the obviously in the national inventory also, so we can differentiate the gases very well. Yes. Well, that's excellent. I mean, if you if if you're willing to share that information with us, we could uh, plug it into the tool for you and provide uh, you know an, an analysis of the benefits. Same thing, actually, Dr. Susanto. I should have mentioned this in terms of the action that's happening. 
uh, in Indonesia, um, if we have tons of methane, um, you know, mitigated from these projects, that can be translated into multiple benefits through this this work that we're doing. Um, hopefully, you find it useful. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. All right. Well, without further ado, we're gonna we're gonna switch to our last uh, presentation, uh, and then uh, by uh, Martial Berno. Uh, he is a soil scientist and expert. Uh, his main fields of expertise at the FAO are the evaluation of the soil's role in forest and agricultural ecosystems in the global climate change context and in carbon sequestration. He will also be managing the panel discussion following this presentation that I'm very much looking forward to. So, Mr. Bruno, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much, Nathan, and thanks for the previous panelists. It was really enlightening um, in this important debate. So I really try to be really brief in my presentation and bring perhaps just some key messages. Uh, I, I hope we can uh, also use perhaps some hours in the discussion. So this presentation was made also with some colleagues, uh, colleagues that are uh, specialists of ND or colleagues, specialists of livestock. So here we are really at the nexus of NDCs on, 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 on livestock. To, to move, not so next, please. Okay. So, so uh, uh, therefore, since the adoption of the Paris Agreement, we are trying to understand uh, how agriculture is represented in the different uh, NDCs. And here you can see out of publication, but just uh, what I have to say here that uh, along those last four years, since uh, basically after the agreement, we started to analyze for the INDC, so the Intended National uh, Determined Contribution, then uh, we are moving to the second round, but for that we developed a lot of guidelines and methodology to understand, because the documents are all different. So basically, we try to to catch all the information in the same uh, use the same database we can share after with all uh, interested stakeholders, and we are also looking at uh, gaps and opportunity, and for that we are going on to the regional level. At NEGOP, we will finalize our first round of regional analysis with Africa, North Africa, and uh, Near East. But also, we are now moving, and I will present the result on what's new uh, in, the, in the new indices. We are updating, also updating the methodology to catch uh, a little bit, um, to see how countries are uh, increasing their ambition, and if when they increase their ambitions, their overall ambition is reflected in the AFOLU sector. So next, please. Okay, so here, just uh, so oh, those are really preliminary, preliminary results, what we are comparing. So in blue, this is uh, the previous NDCs, on in gray, light gray, you can see uh, the new or updated NDC. Uh, and if I focus on the top side of uh, the, the first graphic on top, you can see that as a whole, NDC are no, we have 81% of uh, new weighted NDC are considering agriculture. So it's an improvement in relation to two thirds that uh, we previously uh, have. So, it's uh, showing that we are moving in the right direction. When we look specifically to livestock and grassland, we have also an increase. So from 30 to 36 percent. So quite significant increase. Uh, not all in, uh, new NDCs or updated NDCs are available. We're expecting to, that uh, that will further increase in the coming months uh, as soon as country will submit their, their new updated NDC. So it shows that there is a, a, a mitigation uh, ambition increasing. Here we do not have yet uh, what it represents in terms of uh, amount of, uh, of, uh, of total uh, emission to livestock, but we, we can see already uh, the commitment in terms of number of country is increasing. Uh, something perhaps more also very interesting because you know in NDC you have to aspect mitigation and adaptation. On some countries, uh, mentioning livestock system as uh, an adaptation strategy, and here so there is an increase uh, in number of country that show that include uh, improved livestock and grassland management practices as their 
part of their adaptation strategy. And uh, we know it is also shown by uh, the last IPCC report. Uh, most uh, action when uh, uh, on adaptation strategy have some benefits in mitigation. So here also it can help. Uh, so even if mitigation is not the aim for target, it uh, you will uh, observe uh, mitigation benefits. So next slide, please. Okay, so here we look at uh, the actions or mitigation action that we uh, that we found the different uh, uh, new and updated uh, NDC, and you can see that basically uh, they are uh, quite proposing some holistic approach because they are looking first, okay, in enteric fermentation that come to mind to most people uh, interested by livestock, but they are also looking at the Grasslands, the management of the grasslands, the manure uh, management, uh, also uh, when uh, can manage uh, the cropland uh, see. So let's let's say, for instance, the pastoralism system. So some countries are proposing to have uh, livestock in the middle of uh, mix or complex uh, system. Uh, you can see there is a uh, different uh, percentage of new updated in DC. Uh, uh, when you look at the screen by the mitigation action, so it's not equal in the different region. Uh, you can see that in Latin America and the Caribbean, we have seen the example of uh, Uruguay. Uh, numbers are quite uh, important. And we have seen the presentation from Felipe Garcia that, that also Uruguay is uh, moving in a holistic way, so dealing with anti fermentation, with grassland management, with soil carbon sequestration, so uh, a lot of multiple. Uh, benefits in terms of mitigation, tackling different greenhouse gas. Uh, so perhaps here, we will just open here and move to the next one. And moving here on the, and you can see a major gap on the climate finance aspect. Uh, because when you get NDC, most countries are proposing a target, different targets, sometimes sectoral target, sometimes global target. But most developing countries are requesting also support to implement the action to turn uh, into reality their, their commitment. So most of the time you have a conditional commitment on an unconditional commitment, so depending on the availability of funds. So at FAO, we, we look at the state of the climate finance in the agriculture. For that, we use uh, OCD. Uh, Development Assistant uh, Cooperation uh, Database, the OCDAC uh, database, uh, that has a good advantage to, to, to go back to 2000, so which help us also to understand uh, the, the recent evolution. And here, just to give you um, three numbers. So on the left side, you, you can see this is uh, climate finance in the agriculture sector. So here, this is the agriculture sector. This is not the total. But the climate uh, finance total, it's 466 billion for the full period 2000-2018. Of that, 24% is for agriculture. 24% represents 122 billion. So the graph you can see, this is the 122 billion uh, distributed in a time series on uh, on looking also at mitigation adaptation and cross cutting. So you can see that mitigation for agriculture is a little bit uh, uh, since 2010 more or less the same level on where adaptation is gaining more more funds. So this is really the importance of cross cutting. So cross cutting means when a project we will uh, tackle both mitigation and adaptation since uh, its objective. Since, uh, but basically, here we have also to cut the mitigation co benefits adaptation. And this is also a role that FAO to, to show, showcase to country that when I have some adaptation strategy, sometimes the mitigation co benefits that need to be sized. Sometimes it's not even considered in, uh, in, in the target, but you will have that benefit. So perhaps it's also good to, to have an idea of that. So the first message was 24% for agriculture. The good news, so it was that it was increasing the climate fine as a whole. Plus the not so good news that if you look at the evolution of the share that is not shown here, 
agriculture is the share, uh, the part that is going to agriculture is decreasing regularly. In 2000, it was uh, 2000 to 2003, more than 40 percent. Then it was in the range 30 to 40 percent up to 2012. And since uh, 2012, uh, agriculture is receiving less than 25 percent. And now in 2018, and we are also having the last number for 2019, is 22 percent. So the amount of climate finance to agriculture is decreasing. And all sectors are receiving more uh, proportionally. And the last message here is specifically on livestock. So you can see this is uh, the purple, that purple uh, on uh, the very bottom right of uh, the lid. You can see that few of those climate finance flow is addressing the livestock subsector of, of agriculture. A little bit in Africa, in Asia, on the invisible in the graphic uh, for the other region. So here it's, it's a major gap that has to be also addressed because that sector deserves uh, uh, funding and fine flow if we want to implement also the target that we have seen are increasing. So countries are considering more and more livestock, but then we need to have also the corresponding funds if we want to see this turning into action. Please, next slide. And here to, to, to finalize on showing how we, we have seen, for example, one from, uh, from uh, Indonesia, from Asia, and from Uruguay, Latin America, and just providing some example of, uh, of a policy support by FAO with other agencies to a country like Rwanda, where you can see on the graph this is uh, the speed of the emission for 2015. Uh, as uh, mentioned in their uh, last uh, determined contribution, and you can see that anti fermentation 24 percent, yeah, one fourth, let's say, of uh, the country profile. Manure management topping more 13, so we are reaching 77, 37 percent. Some part managed soil is also the livestock, and so you, you can see that that sector is important for the country. So we are trying to support in the round ambition on climate change in their NDC and policies uh, to uh, on integrating specific intervention. So here you, have, you can see the different uh, steps we, uh, we are taking. So we are helping uh, to identify uh, livestock related equipment using um, uh, an holistic approach a little bit like uh, was presented by the previous speaker in their own uh, NDC. Uh, looking also win-win uh, uh, situation. We link also between the stock uh, on national food. We look at the climate change policies, strategies, and the laws and regulation are in place. We can build on. Uh, you can see we also assess uh, the policy gap and technical gap on the risk where a need would be uh, uh, where it express uh, fun, where we can uh, tap that gap. Uh, we also support uh, stakeholder consultation, with, uh, you can see here, uh, very wide. Uh, also, modeling approach, so with uh, the CCAC uh, model, but there was also other model, um, model for tier two emission uh, 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 on terry fermentation, so the GLIM model. And we hope to complete all uh, those actions by March uh, 2020. And the picture on the, on the right side is all this is working for the country, but for the for the benefits of the small orders that are really the, the that should be the, the, the main target. Uh, as you might not, if you know, we are implementing a new strategy framework that is built on for better better production. So this is with the farmer better nutrition for the people, better environment, a benefits for all for people, individual people, but for the whole society and also for better life and leaving no one behind. This is really what we want to achieve. So next slide, please. And I just want to, to, to thank you on uh, listening to me. Uh, on Nathan, you decide we can move straight forward to the panel discussion. Perhaps you have one question to you. I do, well, uh, yes, I thank you, fabulous.
um, I have uh, profited greatly from the excellent work that you guys have done, uh, particularly in the, in the analysis of the NDCs. I, I, I take your, uh, well, a number of points that uh, you made uh, to heart. One that, you know, it's a mantra of mine and, and of many members of, of the coalition that the fact, you know, the, the best form of adaptation is first fast mitigation, particularly of short lived climate pollutants that can achieve rapid reductions in the rate of change and even perhaps cooling in the near term. Given the right circumstances, the, uh, the, and, and the link between mitigation and adaptation is 1 that we hope uh, that that our, our work in the, with the global methane assessment and this tool can can support going forward. We, I think uh, it'd be nice to facilitate greater cooperation with with FAO on this in particular, you know, I, I understand, you know, adaptation finance to the agricultural sector is primarily financed to help the agricultural sector adapt. Uh, to changes in their environment, but by linking methane mitigation to um, public health uh, by reducing tropospheric ozone exposure, you're actually also making a link to the resiliency and adaptation side of things for, uh, in the public health world. So, you know, you're, you're, we're hopefully creating an additional nexus of collaboration where there are stakeholders that see in the public health space that they would benefit, they would profit from um, greater methane mitigation in the agricultural sector because it increases the resiliency of the population. They're no longer suffering under such a great burden of disease from tropospheric ozone exposure, just as one as one point. I did have one comment, just a funny aside, I guess, that you had a slide where you were looking at the mitigation actions in the uh, agricultural sector, primarily livestock and, and agriculture in the, in the current NDCs. And yet the Near East and uh, North Africa uh, section, it was like 22% of the NDCs across the board had all of the actions that uh, that you uh, uh, you were looking for in the agricultural sector. And the other regions had great diversity among the NDCs. I assume that that's because 22% of the countries in the region included every single one of those mitigation actions. Yes, exactly. Yes, was, we got to capture that uh, that other uh, the the remainder there. That was, uh, anyways, I, wonderful presentations across the board. I look forward to a robust uh, uh, discussion. Now, I do want to take this opportunity before handing it back to you, Marty, um, uh, to remind everybody that to keep using the chat function in um, in WebEx, and if you wish to intervene uh, verbally, uh, please use the hand raising function. Uh, and then we will be able to call on you and add you to the discussion. So, thank you very much over to you. Okay, so. Uh, exchanging your role, so no, you will be a panelist and I will ask questions to you also. <laughs> so, but I will 1st, uh, thank all the panelists uh, for really the, uh, the really interesting uh, presentation. I have some question on, because here uh, I've seen the. the on Indonesia, we've seen also a strong focus uh, on uh, the, the research aspect also to, to, to develop those fields, those, those additives. On, um, on a white presentation, I've seen a lot also on uh, engaged farmers. Uh, but I have a general, uh, perhaps start with a more general question. In terms of uh, when we look at the overall picture of the country level, what kind of regulation can Make the available technologies uh, accessible also to the small orders. So, do, do you, can you, this is a kind of do you have an idea really how best we can uh, draft or do we have already enough regulation that can allow us to transfer the available technology, what science is developing, what is co developed with farmers, but to really be sure that it will reach. The majority of the small holder. So, who want to start? Perhaps just to to to, to add on on that. Uh, do do can you identify that uh, there is gap still in regulation? Or you can say for country we have already all the regulation that can really help us to reach the end user that would be the farmer. Philippe, you want to start? Okay. Yes. I, 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 I'm not very sure that I get your uh, question well, but 
I, I think I, I, I have the main point. Um, I think in Uruguay, I'm 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 not really very um, involved with other country realities, but to reach all the farmers and to reach smallholders, it's mainly uh, a knowledge knowledge uh, challenge in Uruguay. So. Um, you, we are we are thinking on 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 giving them incentives, and there's a discussion now in the country if we uh, should go with economic incentives or only in kind incentives like technical assistance, um, and and I think both are valid in at least in in our in our context. Um, but but I think the the, the in kind um, assistance is is more uh, promising, uh, at least in our projects and in our results. That is what we have found, uh, because it's not an economic. Obviously, incentives economic incentives also have some power. Uh, and, and will always be be attractive, but um, if the farmer has a knowledge gap, no no economic incentive will will work alone. So so every every incentive you you have you are thinking of, it had to be accompanied by by the the something that will break the knowledge gap in the farmers. Oh. Mostly in okay. small or small holder farmers. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't know if I if I answer no, no, you, your you, question. You understand well. We need really to build uh, uh, whatever regulation or support uh, decided by the government should go to uh, having an enabling environment, and that is uh, for part of that enabling environment. You need to have uh, a mechanism to ask. Uh, the farmer uh, to accompany them, to be with them together if they have uh, uh, a problem, because the new, let's say, new, new technology, new approaches might need some uh, some support. Certainly, it's not not uh, any uh, even down regulation or any even financial uh, support that will. Uh, 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 compensate uh, that, that a strong need for farmers to have a, a support to have someone uh, able to answer to them. It's a challenge. It's a. I think it's a great challenge because there are a lot of farmers. You will not be able to reach uh, every one of them, and uh, but uh, the knowledge gap is is is. It's big, so it's a big challenge how to uh, escalate this, this, this uh, improvements and these practices. It's, we are okay. always thinking about that, and we have not the solution, the the, the magical solution yet. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. And I, I want to ask you, Doctor Susanto, are you in agreement with uh, the case? Do you think also that your farm need to be to have a technical system to be able to 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 implement uh, for for instance in your case where I think that it was mostly uh, feeds so providing power feeds that uh, have been developed uh, certainly by a stronger research network uh, in Indo in Indonesia but uh, is that uh, research also research or technical assistance going to support the farmer? Thank you, Mayor Chair um, In technology of feed, we, the Agriculture Ministry Indonesian, Minister Agriculture Indonesian, have the program concentrate, green concentrate. We know that protein can reduce methane emission, so feed from 
uh, legume. We call that as green concentrate. We hope the green concentrate can uh, uh, reduce the em uh, methane emission to the livestock, to cattle. So, uh, two program, second program is dissemination legume seed to all farmers. So, farmer can plant the legume and produce a big uh, uh, green concentrate to the livestock. And third program is uh, improve pasture in the in the livestock uh, greenland uh, management so uh, increasing green increasing plant increasing legume increasing pasture so reduce the methane uh, emission thank you Okay, thank you so much for, 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 for the detail. Uh, first, to follow up uh, on uh, what you are saying, Dr. Susambo, uh, the, I, I would uh, like to ask, is the private sector uh, associated to, to those initiatives? Uh, let's say, for instance, to, to ensure the production of those feeds, to, to distribute those, those feeds, or is it only governmental or sub, uh, sub uh, or local uh, government level? Do you have the private sector involved? Yes. Oh yes. Uh, Particular. Uh, uh, private sector. Private sector, uh, private sector produce the seed legume too. So. Uh, Private sector and government uh, coalition to produce the feed, green concentrate, uh, legume seed, and others. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. So we can see here that we have research uh, developing uh, new feeds. We have the farmer using those feeds, and in the middle, we have yes. also private sector doing the nexus for uh, getting up. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at the chat. Because people are starting to, to ask their question. Um, uh, okay, I can see that there is a question on the, the level of uh, intensity. Uh, I'm not sure you, you can read the question, but uh, the second part, uh, because uh, I guess, Philippe, uh, uh, you mentioned that in your presentation that uh, about reducing the number of livestock farmers. Uh, you said it was not a goal, uh, uh, but you observed uh, at the end, uh, if I remember well, it was 18% reduction of number of animals, something like that. Um, yes. So for you, just a consequence of uh, the fact that uh, the animal, uh, let's say, more healthy, more productive, so basically there is no need to have such number of animals. Am, am I correct, or is it uh, in? Do you have other explanation behind it? Yes. Um, uh, first of all, to 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 put in context the the question, um, as I mentioned in my presentation, livestock production in Uruguay is a very important economic activity. So, in a, in a developing country as, as ours the government is dif um, will hardly will will not be very uh, i don't know how to say it they will not be very willing to policy that will reduce uh, the animals on the country because uh, the economic benefits of the livestock production are very important in the country. So it will mean it, it will not be directly like that, at least in this in these uh, times, maybe in the future. But we have the possibility to reduce the the animals, uh, as I showed in 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 my presentation. 
if the the optimal uh, product productivity is is met when we have a little less animals that we have per farm because we we have to let we have to optimize the grass growth first to have a, a good production in the farm and many times the the farmers are with a lot of animals and to promote grass growth you have to reduce the 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 stocking rate so it it was not a goal in the project and we are finding that the the maybe the optimal uh, quantity of animals per farms are are less than we have today or in the ba baseline uh, also if you are if we are improving productivity and we are improving emission intensity the pro the, the country could have the goal to uh, produce the same with less cattle or to produce more with less cattle if the decoupling is bigger enough to do that in our preliminary results in the project we we are finding that the farms improved production increased production and reduced gross emissions at the same time so the decoupling was enough to reduce animal and increase production so there is some space to uh, reduce the animals and increase production in the country. Uh, as I said before, they, there will be not there will not be a, a policy to reduce directly the animals in in yeah, our no, country. Yeah. No, no, Tom, Tom much. It's, it's it's really clear, and I guess this is thing we are also observing uh, elsewhere. If not in all countries, policies are not let's targeting the uh, the number of animals per se. But they are targeting the productivity that is the benefits for the farmer. Um, so, for uh, as you, but it's interesting to uh, to to see that in your specific case, it's a uh, it's a co-benefits that uh, was not targeted but uh, observed uh, as soon implement a policy that uh, deal with uh, uh, improving the efficiency of your system. So, okay, now thanks for the clarification. The, the, Dr. Yes. Susanto, is it uh, also the case in your country? Uh, policies, um, national policies or, or regulation are mostly targeting uh, improving the revenue of the farmer and helping them to have more productive system. Oh, yes. Uh... There are regulations to support NDC, to support uh, reduce uh, emission on the law and uh, uh, regulation for agriculture ministry and other. Uh, so, uh, regulation support to the uh, reduce uh, methane emission for the livestock and others. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So it's a really confirmation that the policies really uh, are targeting the, the, either the greenhouse gas with a mitigation target, but with the three point of most of the time of uh, supporting a more product system uh, for the benefits of, uh, of the farm. And also for the, as a, uh, Nate and uh, perhaps uh, those policies uh, uh, it's something probably interesting because when uh, when you presented your tool uh, uh, here I'm talking about policies for agriculture but uh, we see that a, a policy for agriculture can benefit the overall society and perhaps vice versa you can uh, I don't know if you are aware or if there is example of policies targeting let's say uh, health, public health, that uh, impacted at the end also on uh, the agriculture sector or the greenhouse gas sector. Do you, can you comment on that? Mm, say intertwin policies or co-benefits of different policies? Just, so you're asking whether or not we are looking at, at policies that 
where the primary objective is public health benefits, whether or not we, we look at sort of the, the, the nexus to agriculture, is that? I, I guess both. Do you, do you, can you see some policies in just uh, saying health, but that have co-benefits from agriculture that are impacting the agriculture sector, or vice versa, policy in the agriculture sector that will implement or have co-benefits for health on where it was perhaps the first end? Yes. Um, well, uh, in terms of concrete examples, I'm not sure I could give you one at, at this exact moment, but the, that is the intention. We are all about co-benefits, bringing together stakeholder groups that didn't feel like maybe for the last 40 years of real, you know, meaningful global climate action didn't feel like they had um, any real interactions or, or that uh, their objectives could be met with actions that achieve the objectives of other ministries or agencies. So, you know, when it when it comes to the agricultural sector, sustainable food systems, sustainable agriculture, it's a it's a very powerful driving force. Um, uh, and is, uh, you know, it, it's it's part of the mantra and but. Um, we have found that that it doesn't necessarily look at at you know sustainability. It looks at different sustainability metrics than than the ones that we highlight with methane. We hope that by by highlighting the fact that methane can achieve substantial benefits for public health, uh, avoided warming, uh, you know, uh, avoided extreme weather events through that nexus and and other benefits. We can actually bring that particularly to the sustainable agricultural. Uh, community and arm them with additional arguments to to mobilize resources in, in other communities like like the public health community. I um, I was going to say something. Uh, <laughs> no, but uh, 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 I guess you know, so when the when you were moving to the you, you mentioned the avoid of burning or residue burning. Uh, Something uh, I think really important uh, with also potential linking with livestock, because for instance, uh, when you do not burn some residue, you can, as uh, we have seen the presentation from uh, uh, from Indonesia, you perhaps you can use also the residues in as a feed for 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 animal. So uh, you might for avoiding burning reduce for sure air pollution, which is. Uh, uh, I guess everyone is aware that uh, burning residues produce a lot of uh, uh, particles uh, that are in the air, uh, strong pollutant on, uh, affecting cities also. Uh, so avoiding burning, you have it here, I can see with livestock, with the feed on, uh, with a rebound effect, you can perhaps also uh, promote reduce, reduction of uh, fermentation. Correct. Yes, and with the, I should be clear with the methane assessment, and the methane tool, we look specifically at at the methane uh, mitigated from different measures uh, when it comes to burning of agricultural waste or open burning of, of any uh, uh, materials. Uh, that's some, in terms of linking that to multiple benefits, air quality uh, you know, um, and public health. Uh, we have other tools that we work with, for example, the LEAP IBC tool that was developed by the Stockholm Environment Institute that can make those connections much more explicitly. Our uh, stock and trade in the CCAC is to, to make these co-benefits and these links very clear, but, but as much as possible to quantify them. And so we rely on quantifiable metrics, sort of first order quantifiable benefits or impacts um, you know, that, that flow directly from changes in air, uh, air pollutant concentrations or from changes in, in forcing because we've reduced greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, it would be, um, I would welcome the opportunity, I think our entire scientific community would welcome the opportunity to go to the next level, do the kind of work that you guys are doing in the FAO and not only connect methane to ozone to public health, but you know, go to the second order impacts that can be quantified in terms of what can be done with uh, agricultural waste if it's not being burned. Right. Uh, what other benefits are being achieved? What other economic benefits are you know being being achieved? That would be an enormous boon to our community if we were able to start making those links. Uh, actually, two other points I wanted to make. Um, one, I think it's really interesting with methane. 
uh, and it, it was important that you were, you were mentioning uh, PM 2.5 from agricultural waste. Like PM 2.5 is a local air pollutant. It's a regional air pollutant. In some instances, it, it has global impacts, but when it comes to preventing burning of waste or ag you know, agricultural waste, it, it has immediate benefits for the region that uh, where, where you're, you're preventing that activity. Methane, however, is a well-mixed greenhouse gas. It's why it's in the Kyoto basket. It's why it was part of the UNFCCC from the very beginning. And that means that whereas if you eliminate a source of particulate matter air pollution in say Vietnam, right? You're gonna see immediate benefits in Vietnam, in Malaysia, right? In, 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 the, in the region. Um, and then you will slowly see benefits, uh, you know, in, in a broader area when it comes to methane, uh, but, but you're, un I should say, you're unlikely to see public health benefits from uh, an, a, a, an intervention in Vietnam. You're, you're unlikely to find them in Brussels, right? You're unlikely to see a public health benefit in Brussels because PM 2.5 was reduced in, in Vietnam. It's very different with methane. Methane's well mixed, which means that if you mix methane in Monaco, it's going to have impacts uh, uh, on ozone formation in Montevideo, right? So uh, it, th there is a very interesting and different story to tell in terms of targeting methane mitigation. You are achieving local benefits for air quality, but you're also benefiting the entire planet, the the the, the ecosystems and the human beings on this planet. And I think that that's I think. It's a it's a narrative that's rather new uh, in the air quality climate nexus, and one that I think we want to we want to uh, explore how we can benefit from that both in the UNFCCC, for example, with a COP coming up in a couple of weeks, and with air quality management. And one final, let's say, rather flippant point I want to make: we are all about co-benefits, linking mitigation and, and adaptation, and public health and, and mitigation. And I wonder, particularly, uh, Martial, because you're in Rome. Um, whether or not we can explore how livestock management can benefit methane mitigation in other sectors. I know that Rome is uh, is currently uh, deployed roams of, of uh, wild boars uh, to consume your, your biological waste, uh, which I'm assuming has some beneficial impact on methane from the waste sector. I don't know what that does for the agricultural uh, methane emissions, but but I think it's an area that might be explored. And I think they're doing something similar in Barcelona, where yeah. the boards are so, attacking Europe. Yeah, no, for sure, Nate, I need to explore uh, any possibility of further collaboration. Uh, uh, perhaps I will pick one word you mentioned in, in, in your last part. It's COP26. On uh, perhaps uh, Dr. Uh, Augusto Zambo and Felipe Garcia, uh, simple question. And I don't know if you have the answer. But uh, what is your expectation from COP26? Uh, Do you have expectation that it will save your country? Oh, is your country will be active uh, in that COP? I know that Uruguay was uh, uh, in the presidency of a regional group uh, of uh, ministries of agriculture discussing uh, the Placa. Uh, I know that Indonesia is also part of uh, uh, ASEAN uh, regional group. Uh, so what kind of, if you would, I don't know if you will attend COP, if you would, both of you attend COP, what would be your message to the other delegates you would bring? Should we consider agriculture in the discussion of a climate change convention? So, Philippe, yes. you start? Yeah. Oh, Dr. Agus, please. Yeah. Indonesian uh, come to the delegate to COP to 2021, uh, Minister of uh, Environment, Environment and, forestry. and Forestry from okay. Indonesia, for Republic Indonesia, Ministry of Environment and Forestry, uh, delegate to uh, COP 2021. Uh, I think uh, Indonesian government and private support, yeah, support to reduce uh, methane uh, emission and, uh, and 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 uh, solve the problem of environment. Thank you. Okay, so thank you. So linking environment and uh, all ministries together at COP to reduce. Uh, 
the main mission. Philippe, the same? Yes, yes. Um, I'm, I am not in the delegation. I'm not in international negotiation, but I, I will uh, make a general answer. Um, Uruguay is always okay. Uruguay is always willing to 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 discuss um, and and to share experience within between countries to be able to to address the challenges we have as a humanity in, in our global agenda and in, in our climate change change uh, challenges. We hope agriculture is uh, a key a key topic. We are uh, particip participating in recops uh, spaces to 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 promote this. We think that uh, food production and emissions is a um, is big challenge. is a is a topic that must be uh, very discussed and, and we we should get to to uh, better solutions in 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 this in this topic we have to also separate these topics from uh, some some lobby interests and and some uh, mixtures with other interests uh, so um, yes we 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 will be there uh, willing to 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 support the 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 COP results and the to support also the 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 finding of solutions in the in the food production and and agriculture uh, sector because we think um, it's it's a very important discussion for the for the world and also for us yes okay no fa fa fantastic it's really it's really great to hear that. Uh, I guess we are all the same age, and that hoping that uh, a convention that mostly with environmental issue, climate change, will take into consideration the voice of uh, land, agriculture, livestock uh, in their decision. Uh, there is a specific uh, peak of negotiation that is Coronivia Joint on Agriculture, which also mentions livestock, manure management, soil all those points that we have seen in your presentation. So uh, I guess we are all sharing the same hope that uh, that COP will uh, really support uh, what we have seen today, countries moving, having pledged, reduce their emission uh, due to, to methane and to, uh, in relation to agriculture and in relation to livestock. And we need to have a strong political signal at COP level uh, to also support the country community. Uh, having said that, uh, I'm quite sure we are in time. Am, am I correct? So uh, I, I want really to thank uh, all of you, uh, panelists, for, for sharing. Uh, you have said, Philippe, important sharing. So thanks to uh, August, to Philippe, who have shared their, uh, their experience from their country. Uh, thanks also for the Climate and Clean Air Coalition for organizing that uh, really interesting session. Thanks, Nathan, to bringing all the, the, the wonderful numbers we have seen on offering also your, your hands and certainly uh, your hands to support countries. And so together with FAO, we can also uh, improve or certainly or offer of, of support. So I, I want to thank all of you for having attended uh, and that, uh, that's heaven. So, over and um, have a nice evening or night where, where you are. Thank you so much uh, for this robust discussion and all the presentations. Before you all leave, I, I do want to let everybody know that we have one more webinar. It's next week, the 12th of October, on government action to reduce methane from organic waste. If you enjoyed this one, I, I very much encourage you to join the next. Uh, it, it should have a, there should be a very robust discussion and all of this is leading us towards what I hope is going to be a very exciting and dynamic COP, uh, particularly with this global methane pledge uh, coming out. Uh, there's going to be a lot of action and focus on methane going forward. So, again, thank you all on behalf of the Climate and Clean Air Coalition and all of our, uh, the, the, the presenters and all of our partners. Have a good morning.
day, afternoon, or night, wherever you are in the world. Well, thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you to all.